what I love about racing as opposed to training is that for me, um, yes, I can put out effort in training, but nothing, nothing has mimicked the last like 10 miles of an Ironman or an ultra marathon like racing has. Like I can't, I haven't been able to, to get the full buy-in with my mind that I can when I'm racing. So I take myself to a different level when I'm racing. So I think racing is, I love it. You know, when I first started meditating, I said to my teacher, I said, I feel like, you know, training for Ironman and meditating, it's like the fast track. And he said, yeah, a hundred percent. Like, because not only am I using the tenacity and the will and the discipline with my training, I'm using the tenacity and the will and the discipline with my daily practice. And the two of those things together are just super powerful. What's up, you guys? Welcome back to episode 142 of the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. I'm Jess, I'm your host. And we're here with our January episode of Ask the YTs. We've got some listener questions that we're going to dive into, a little chit chat, maybe just a few moments because we want to get in so we can all get out. No, (laughs) we want to be efficient. (laughs) I like that. Yeah. Uh, But if this is your first time listening, you know, this is the place where every week we share stories of people looking, finding, and living their purpose. And I think that you and I, Beach, are uh, are no exception to that rule. And this podcast is a limb of its mothership, Yogi Triathlete, where we offer triathlon and run coaching, mindfulness and meditation, the M21 revolution, plant-based nutrition. We have two cookbooks. Am I forgetting something? Yoga. Podcasting. Yeah, well, obviously. Yeah, obviously. We're podcasting right now. But the uh, the team is growing. Team is growing. Yeah, and with that, I'd like to welcome Brad Colbert to the team. His wife got him a gift certificate for the holidays, so that is something that we offer. If you want your spouse or friend or anyone to join the team and you feel compelled to to have them join, you can get a gift certificate for a month of coaching, a month of run coaching, uh, plant-based nutrition too, and mindfulness uh, sessions. You can you can get that as a gift certificate. So let us know. So Brad's on the team. He's local here. He's a swimmer, but he also bikes and runs. And we're welcome. We're glad to have him on the team. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's growing, you guys. So if you're thinking about hopping on Team YT, definitely do that because we're going to be capping it pretty soon. We're going to be welcoming on two more athletes in the next two weeks. So we're getting to the point, we're getting to that point where we're going to cap off uh, coaching with Yogi Triathletes. So if you're thinking about it and been considering and looking for that way to up-level your performance and your mind in life, then join Yogi Triathlete. We're here, ready to help. Awake and ready to help. All right, let's jump right into uh, the conversation here. So we've got two questions that actually came in after we recorded last month's uh, episode. So we're going to start off with those. The first one is, I love this question. What are your thoughts around ego in racing? Why race? When training can so closely simulate racing now, are we racing to fuel an ego? Or does it serve some other purpose? And you look at it from a simplistic perspective. Yeah, so what do you think about that? Well, because we were talking earlier. Yeah, about so this I question. think I think that there's a lot of qualities of competition and racing that mimic the qualities and skills that you need on this spiritual path. And because we are spiritual beings living a human experience, you know, we dropped into these bodies uh, on this earth school to learn and to grow. And that's why we're here. We're here to learn and to grow so that we can purify ourselves to a point where we get back to our oneness. And that oneness is, it's unconditional love. It's unshakable. It's undisturbed. It's unchanging. It's truly the only thing that is unchanging. And therefore, if it's unchanging, then it is true, right? The only thing that's unchanging is who we truly are and the source from which we come. So to walk this path, you know, we call it the warrior path. I'm specifically talking about the spiritual path here, meditation, mindfulness, like getting 
in touch and communing with and living from the perspective of your bigger self, your capital S self. It takes a really tenacious person. It takes a lot of will. It takes unshakability. It takes steadfastness. It takes the ability to, to sit in the discomfort. It, um, it takes perseverance. It's like 24 seven, no time off. I mean, it really sounds like the lifestyle of a triathlete or any kind of, um, you know, athlete that's really going for it. And I've used all of the same qualities and skills that I use in my meditation and in my mindful living that I've had to use to get myself to the finish line. Like it's been intense. Yesterday, Beej, you and I sat at the self-realization fellowship and meditated. And towards the end, there was just this really strong urge to open my eyes and, and call it on the meditation, like just be done with it now. And I knew that that was resistance. I knew that that was just an uncomfortable energy that I was facing. And I just really like my breath kind of ramped up a little bit. It got really, really strong. I had to turn up the volume of my breath to just sit there in silence and not knowing how long we had left in that meditation, resisting opening up my eyes and looking at the timer. Because what would that do? Right. It would give my mind some peace, right? To know, to, know right. to have the knowing that this is the exact time that you have. It would give, but what are you going to change? What well, you, it would get, well, what I would, what I would do is I would say, oh, there you go, mind. You won that round. And that's not what I'm interested in doing. I'm not interested in letting the mind run my life. So I'm interested in like letting my big self r- be in charge of my life because my big self created this world. Your big self created this world. Everybody's big capital S self. Like we have the energy to create worlds within us. That's who we truly are. That's who I want running my show here. And so it took like, I swear it took so much for me to sit there. The impulses were, and their egoic impulses were so strong to come out of that meditation to the point where like my body started aching. I felt like I was going to explode. And it was just this really intense energy that was resistance because anytime that you're going to up level, you're going to get resistance. Anytime you're going to better yourself, you're going to get resistance. Because the mind wants to default to what's comfortable. And that's something that it does every day, right? Right. Cause so, it needs the certainty. The mind needs, needs certainty. certainty and we're hardwired as human beings. We have that reptilian brain that says, uh, you need to survive. And so of course it's gotten a little out of hand with, you know, how it comes into play, right? Like sitting in meditation, I'm getting like a reptilian, uh, impulse saying like, this is uncomfortable, get out, get out, get out, get out. And instead I stayed, I stayed, I stayed. And so that's the same exact steadfastness that you need to hold that interval that you're doing. Well, I had that this morning. It's funny you say that. I had it this morning, 6 a.m. on the trainer going into that second interval. And I wanted to check the time. Like I, I was doing five by 10 minute intervals at a sweet spot intensity, which is just uncomfortable enough. And my mind wanted to go to the point where how much time do I have left? It doesn't like and that it's, unknown. It's super easy. I just have to click my phone and bring up the screen. Oh, that it's has super, it. it's, it's so, so available. It's so available. But here's, here's where I think you're going with what, what you're talking about with the question is to be in that moment, notice the thought and you have that space and you don't choose to indulge that thought and you just continue to do the work for the sake of the work. You just continue, I just continue to turn over the pedals. Time goes by. You know, time is the, the factor in this that is, that we wanna know. It's the known, it gives us a gauge of where we are or, or how much we have left. So when you can just get into that feeling, that feeling of accepting what is and not resisting and trying to find out, when you just can accept what is, then, then you it's certainly, it's a must you up level. Oh yeah, you're you up level your mind. Now you're thinking like, whoa, well, what isn't possible for me? As long as I can choose which thoughts I want to indulge in and which thoughts I don't, then what's stopping me from being the greatest athlete, mom, worker, whatever, the best I can be. Like, yeah, what is I mean, that's me? ju- the only thing that would be stopping you is belief systems and mind 
um, patterns and, um, and the ego, right? So let's talk a little bit about the ego. Um, so the ego does get, I think, a bad rap. Um, the ego, I think a really simple way to describe it is just, it's a separation device. So it's our individuality. It makes me Jess, it makes you BJ. It makes me think that I'm not you, right? And that you're not me, that I'm not Clark. When in fact, I know that our essence is exactly the same. So I guess I would call that the negative ego. Um, and if there is a positive ego, it's that ego that, um, is going to help us stay steadfast. It's go, it's a, it's, it's a very powerful energy and the ego, the negative ego, the one that wants to keep us separate, the one that makes us feel like we're alone in this or that we can't do what we've set out to do or, um, the ego that says, don't get up early this week and do the workout. You've done enough, all that stuff. Um, that's simply the soul turned in the opposite direction. So it's the soul looking in the opposite direction. Because the soul and the ego are, the, are same. the same. Because there's only one. Boom. Yeah. So there's only one. <laughs> yeah. There's only one of everything. There's only one. So the soul and the ego are the same. So what happens is we come here to this earth. We go through the amnesia portal known as the birth canal. We come out. We forget who we are. And the ego is turned in the opposite direction. It's the soul turned in the opposite direction and it connects in with the worldly ways, the physical world. And immediately our parents do it. And if we had a child, we'd probably would have done it too. You know, like we label that child as girl or boy, we give them a name and you need those things to conduct yourself in this world. But what we're not really encouraged to also cultivate is the fact that those things are not who we are. They are what we have here in this world. So the ego isn't bad, but it can, we can use it to separate us further. Um, and really what we want to do through meditation and mindfulness is eventually that ego turns around and all of that power from the ego will start being used for the good of all as opposed to just the good for Jess. And that's kind of the difference, right? Yep. So the ego is alive and well in competitive sports. It's really a fun study to see. But what I love about racing as opposed to training is that for me, um, yes, I can put out effort in training, but nothing, nothing has mimicked the last like, 10 miles of an Ironman or an ultra marathon like racing has. Like I can't, I haven't been able to, to get the full buy-in with my mind that I can when I'm racing. So I take myself to a different level when I'm racing. So I think racing is, I love it. You know, when I first started meditating, I said to my teacher, I said, I feel like you know, training for Ironman and meditating, it's like the fast track. And he said, yeah, a hundred percent. Like, because not only am I using the tenacity and the will and the discipline with my training, I'm using the tenacity and the will and the discipline with my daily practice. And the two of those things together are just super powerful. And you're detaching, you're working on detaching from that end result in the race. Oh, so yeah. that's, that's the up leveling like there. I'm so grateful. I feel like I'm so past that. I really am. And I'm sure the universe is going to give me an opportunity to test that at some point. But, you know, it really is that practice of doing the work for the sake of the work. And doing the work for the sake of the work means you're so skillful at being present that the present moment and what is happening in that present moment is the reward that you're not looking forward into the future for a reward because the moment of life that you're living and the action that you're taking is the reward. And you're not looking in the past for, for something that happened in the past that was miraculous that you can ease up on the present moment saying you've already experienced it in the past. You're okay. Right. You can give up. You can give up. You can give up. Right. So it's that, it's that balance. I feel racing just puts that, atmosphere around you to to stand up and use what you've learned in training and test it out like be in this situation that's going to test you in every way crowds the unknown cold water cold trails 
rain, snow, whatever it is, it can only happen on race day. So it's so beneficial to put yourself into that experience, but understand that whatever experience you have is the exact experience you were meant to have. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. And the, to control the ego that. is not your enemy. No. What it, and you said something to me. You said something to me a couple of years ago. You were like, it, well, that's your ego. And then I said, do I? Oh, I'll not, I'll totally, I totally remember that moment. I've, I've talked about that moment with people before. I have an ego, I said? Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what you said. I, and so we were in the kitchen in our house in Newport, and, I, and you said something. And I said, well, that's your, I said, that's just the ego. And you looked at me and you go, you think I have an ego? Like, and it was totally your ego responding. And I'm <laughs> sit, standing there going, whoa, I thought he was way further along than this. Are you kidding me? He doesn't even realize like that he has this ego Obviously not. that's working through him. So the mind is the organ for the ego. Think about that. The mind is the organ for the ego. Okay. So it's, you know, what, how's your inner house? How's that mind, right? Are you in that separation? Are you... Are you still blaming people for things? Are you still thinking that things happen to you and not for you? Um, is there right or wrong in your world? You know, things like that. That's, that's all ego and it's coming through the mind. And the, the only difference between like um, that and Gandhi, who had, you know, was definitely using his ego. I mean, he took on an entire freaking country and his whole stance was nonviolence. That took incredible tenacity, incredible, um, will and steadfastness. And he was using the ego, but his ego was for the good of all because he wanted, his intention was to leave this earth with, um, this message of nonviolence, right? Nonviolence. And so the only difference is that his ego, uh, was turned around and was shining, it was shining out through the spiritual eye because the spiritual eye and the ego and the chakra system, they're on the same pole. So based on the education that I've had through my teacher, um, these are, this is what I've learned. So yeah, I think, I think racing's awesome. I think that I've, I mean, I see the crossover and the deeper that I go with both racing and both my spiritual practice. I mean, there's no line for me. Um, you know, when I go out there and race, it's all, it's all yoga. And meditation. It's a long meditation. Meditation me. yeah. is a, a limb of yoga. So for me, it's all yoga. And from the simplistic perspective, you know, we are all, every being that lives, has lived, will ever live on this earth. This earth is here for a very specific purpose. It is a school. And so every single one of the spiritual beings living these human experiences are on the same path. We are all on the same path back to that oneness. So some of us are going to do it. We're going to finish it out in this lifetime. Some of us have more lifetimes. Um, but every single one of us is heading in that direction. So whether you're meditating or not now, just know that if you're a competitor, you're prepping yourself for it because you've got, this is why we work with athletes. They've got the will and the discipline and the tenacity that it takes to walk this path because it's a, it's a warrior path. And I think that racing is a warrior path too. I agree. I completely agree. All right. So second question. This is from Lauren. Walk me through how you choose races. Do you have a races or does something feel right? So you do it. What do you think of the concept of a races versus what some may consider a lesser race? Do you see any benefit either for yourselves or your athletes to use this strategy? Beach, I'm going to have you start off with this. So yeah, as a, as an athlete who raced a lot early on in, in my triathlon career, I get it. I get that you want to be out there and you want to use the speed and use all the, the training that you've, that you've built up over the season or the year or two that you've been training. You want to get out there and you want to test yourself. I get it. And maybe you want to work on the run. So you want to do more run races. Yeah, that's great. Awesome. So yeah, there are races that you should have as an A, B, or C race. And the coach and the athlete need to set up those expectations, both that 
this is a C race. So you are gonna go in not well tapered and the expectations of the race are to accumulate probably race experience or to test out where you are in your lead up to the A race. And understand, this is key too, understand that a C race or B race doesn't mean that you're not gonna perform well. You can perform exceptionally well and exceed all expectations. But the original discussion with the coach and the athlete should be, this is not what we're aiming for. This is not what we're going to the well for. We're going to the well in our A race. And as long as that's set up and, and clear between both athlete and coach, then I, I strongly encourage them. And, and I was doing that myself when I was being coached. I loved racing. I think there was a season there, I was picking up every race I could. You know, the we Older. raced every weekend. Stroke and Stride like, series was every Thursday night. Back like 2006, 2007, we raced every weekend in Colorado. All a lot. like it didn't matter to 10K. me if it was a sprint or if it was an Olympic or whatever it was. We just jumped in. We raced so much. It was really fun. It was fun. Now, yeah. but now I'm in a different spot. So if you're asking me, if you're asking where. The benefits are for just planning out your your season now in where i am now in, in my triathlon career and where some people get to quicker is that you just have this focus and you just have one race you take one race at a time so i have one a race it's called it's iron man santa rosa it's in may it's called iron it's man. called iron man santa rosa <laughs> <laughs> that's what it's called <laughs> and that's where i'll be and that's my a race and I don't have anything planned after it or before it. It's just this one race. And I move, this is where I move from presence and feeling. I feel into what my body and mind are telling me, whether through meditation or through uh, some reflection after that first race. I'll know what the next thing is. But right now, I need to stay focused. And this is where you focus, if you have high goals and you're committed to one particular distance or race series or uh, a time goal for a particular race, then you stay committed to that race. You send all of your faculties, your belief system, your training, your meditation, everything goes into this because you want to exhaust all options. You want to exhaust everything into this experience and know when you leave this experience that you've given everything you had and that you're ready to move on. That's what I worked with my meditation teacher with and my past coaches. I remember one thing that Lucho said to me was, you know, I asked him if I, if I could do a sprint triathlon on my quest for getting to Kona. And he said, well, that's, you know, how is that serving you? How is that going to serve you to do a, to do a sprint race when your focus is to go three times as long? And that's one perspective, but it's one that I could relate with. And from the past two or three years, I've just moved from presence. I move from race to race i and, don't and you don't worry about if a race is sold out like for you if it's sold out then you're fine it's just what's open what doesn't what doesn't resonate with me any me anymore is this is the tiers for iron man signups or the actual race those have nothing on me so 20 bucks more to pay or 50 bucks more to pay it, it doesn't or you know there's only 50 slots left that doesn't that's not, I'm not their client. They're not marketing to me. I'm going to do a race that feels right for me, that's open, if it's open. And if it falls on the date that I am feeling into it, I'll do it. But as far as athletes go, because this is a great question. Yeah, you want to plan out the season. You want to get that A race, whatever it is. Maybe two A races, that's stretching in a little bit. Then some B and definitely some C races. If you like to race a lot, gain experience. If you're relatively new to the new to the sport so i feel like i'm i feel like i'm racing a lot this year like what but what did you do last year last year i did two 50ks and a 40 and then what did you miler. do the year before um uh, half iron man and 150k right so you're leading yeah. this is this is what this is great this is awesome so this is your third year in ultra distance racing yeah. now you're now it's time to up the game like, i'm upping the game right but but it's because you're moving from how you feel like right. you feel now it's, it's still you're still a little scared there's a little oh definitely not scared i should say there's excitement, excitement. 
there's excitement. There's excitement, and you've got a lofty schedule, right? How many races do you have um, this year? One, two, three, four, four races. But the one that's in the forefront of my mind right now isn't even my race. It's that I'm pacing um, my friend Lisa, who's my running one of my running partners that I run with a lot, and I'm going to pace her at the Tahoe rim trail um 100 in july and it was just like in my meditations it just kept coming up like that i was supposed to be in service of her and so i was excited about it so i hadn't sent her the text and then yesterday like sent her a text and of course i had that ego in my head going she's already got her crew and she was like are you serious would you pace me and i'm like ah because then i'm like oh it's gonna i'm gonna be pacing her in the dark and it's and it's like in Tahoe and that's like, those are real mountains and like, it's a, it's high and, but it's all exciting. And it's like, I'd have it no other way because I, I don't, I, I'm not cool with the status quo, man. Like I want to keep up leveling. And I know that that calling to be in service of her is an up level and I'm excited and I want to be in service for her. And, and I want to be like, my intention is to be very much like fit and, and ready to be there for her in July. And what's so cool is you, you don't have a race on the schedule. You weren't planning to do that. And this is what happens when you just leave your schedule open. Right. You, you have a few races and then you just be in the moment and yeah. that just hit you. I saw the whole thing unfold firsthand <laughs> and it's so exciting. Now that's what you're doing. That's, that's how it falls into place. The same thing happened with me last year with Utah's toughest after Mount Tremblant. Like mm -hmm. it just fell into place. Yeah. Some things fall into place. Like in 2017, I was on the swim of, um, Santa Rosa 70.3 and I'll, I took a stroke. I took a breath. I looked up at the mountains and I just knew I was going to be running Lake Sonoma 50. I hadn't even run my first 50 K at that point. No, I had, I had actually just run my first 50 K at that point. So I knew I was already in love, but I, and, and so I've been following that race and, um, and currently on the wait list, but if you've listened to our other podcast, you know that I'm very much training for it and um, knowing that I'm going to get in this year. So that's exciting and it's relentless. That's how they describe it. And I'm pumped about it. So, you know, I think for like, so then you're looking at my schedule. So it's Lake Sonoma 50 miler. And then the week after is Mendocino 50K. And then Havelina 100k in October and then like three weeks after that is going to be the North Face Challenge 50k. So would Havelina and Lake Sonoma both be A races? Good. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Go big. We're going big. 50 miler and 60. Yeah. So what do you guys <laughs> think? What do you guys think I should do in 2020? Should 100 we start, miler. Do we need to do the obvious math? We need to do the 100 miler. I, I know I'm totally it's just a matter that. of time I totally am gonna do it it's just a minute it's just it's coming closer it's calling me so we'll just see we'll just see when it shows up okay next question from Lupe how is it living with your coach and living with your athlete so wow that's a good question yeah it is a good question because I think it's really changed over the years but BJ and I have been together since we were I was 25 years old so you do the math yeah 21 it's years. 20, yeah, it's 22 years this year 22. that we've been together. 22 years. And we've worked together since day one because he was the marketing manager and I was the sales manager. So we worked together. And then we went out on our own and we worked together. And then we took a little break while I was doing massage and you were doing your business, but always had been entrepreneurs and always co we were coached by the same coach we race together, train together, like BJ and I are together a lot and have been a lot over these last 22 years. And I mean, I can tell you that when I first started coaching with BJ, there was times where I felt like I wasn't getting the attention that other athletes were getting, that my workouts weren't in there. And so, you know, as I got more skillful on my path, I realized that that's just a victim mentality and that has nothing to do with what BJ was doing. It had everything to do with how I was choosing to respond to it. And so I look deeply at that victim mentality and I still look at it when it shows up, you know, like, um, I don't know if it's whenever it shows up, like, I don't know, like I'm tired and I've got to go do a workout. Like I don't want to do the work, you know, that victim mentality. There's no power in that. So 
I think for me at first, there was like a little push pull, you know, like I wanted my workouts in with everybody else, but then like I wouldn't work, look at the workout. So, you know, just kind of silliness there, but I love it. I mean, if, if anything, um, because I've, I've, I don't need my workouts in a, a week before. I don't need my workouts in three days, but I don't need that. I actually don't even want that. I just, when I look at training peaks in the morning, I'd like to have a workout in there. And if I don't, I notice the response to that. Is my response annoying? You know, am I annoyed by that? Well, that's my stuff that I get to clear up. That's my inner house that I get to clear up. It has nothing to do with BJ. It's just the fact that if I don't have a workout, that's the catalyst for showing me that I've still got, you know, this pettiness inside of me that I get to clean up. So it's hard at this point, the perspective that we have, at least for me, it's hard at this point to say that it's difficult because I actually like it. I mean, I think I probably get um, the most immediate response from BJ. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about my training and sometimes, you know, we'll talk about it over dinner. Like, how are you doing? How are you feeling? What's tomorrow look like? So the, the feedback and the change and everything, it's really on the fly. I think it's, we've, I feel like we're in a, a good groove, like a better groove than we ever have been. And I can't imagine that that's not going to continue to get better and better and better. Yeah. From my perspective, just having the athlete here, knowing the feedback, like you're having sensation in your, you know, hamstring, we can, it's literally like, okay, well, let's do this right away. You and I can just jump on the floor. We can do a stretch. We can do single leg squats. Like we can just jump into it, which is really, it's really cool because you can see things happening as in real time. And then the, the fact of you're not feeling like all of a sudden you have two appointments and you're like, I have 30 minutes. What can I do? Yeah, that happens a lot. And it's like, just, I want you to go run out to the coast down the street and do some stair repeats and then come home. Like just get 20 minutes, get it done. And then if you have time later on, do yoga or something. So I believe that this relationship works so well because it's, it's moving from presence. It's literally moving from it really presence is. Yeah. and it's real time. And you know, not every athlete gets that. <laughs> You're certainly the special one of the group. It's just because I live here and but I'm your you're, wife. I look at you and see you every day. But you know, and you know me very well too. I do. I know your tendencies. I know I have a feel that you like to do group runs with your ladies on Sunday. So I know that Saturdays are busy podcast days. So Saturdays are so busy. Yeah. You can like have you, something short. You know my schedule and it doesn't fluctuate too, too much. much. No, it doesn't. No. It's um, we're pretty routine. Routine's really. Im I think routine is important. Um, we talk about that with our meditation teacher. Like routine is important, and um, and but you know, like meditation is the most important thing. I will not do a workout to get my meditation in. That's the most important thing. It's the it's the single most important thing that I can do on any day that I live on this earth, is meditate. So for me to skip meditation, it's very very rare. Even if it's shortened, it will it will happen. And when it's shortened, I take a good look at why. Um, but we have a lot of fun too. So having yeah, we know, have a lot of fun. meeting at the pool together. We get to swim a lot, and mm -hmm. I give you your workout right there. How has it been since I've pulled away from try? Like because it's clear that I'm not doing anything difficult in the pool. And yeah, I haven't seen you show up a lot to the pool. I feel like I've been the... going twice a week <laughs> lately. For two weeks, I've been going twice a week. How is it? Because when we were training for Ironman, it was on. Like we were on the trainer side by side for hours. We were in the pool side by side for hours. And like that was back in the day when I was swimming faster than you. Yeah. How has it been? Like you kind of got left in the. Yeah, it was a transition period. I'll be honest. It, it took a it took a few months, you know, some transition time. Like we actually sold your bike and then, you know, maybe I resisted <laughs> it a little bit. Well, because when I make a decision, like it's done. Like action is taken. The mm -hmm. bike needs to be sold. Like there's no lingering. And it's, it kind of reminds me of like when I closed my massage practice and you were like, why are you selling your massage table? I'm like, cause I'm not practicing anymore. And you thought maybe I was going to keep it so I could give you massage. I'm like, no, that may, like I'm not practicing anymore. So I was wondering when you were going to pick up on the fact that I wasn't going to be swimming in the pool three or four times a week. And yeah, it was a good trans. It was a good experience. 
I chalk it up to, to, to the growth of myself as a coach and as a human being and as an athlete, you know, rising up, knowing that, you know, I'm, this is a solo, this is something I, a path I need to take on my own. I need to explore. I need to rise up and, and show up to the pool without my wife and show up to the trails or run without my wife and celebrate those times that we do take yoga class together and that we do swim together. Like those moments matter. But for the majority of time, yeah, I mean, I'm solo. This is what I do. I'm, I'm a triathlete and it takes up a lot of my time, but I enjoy every moment. And there aren't moments that I don't think of you, you know, I, you come into my awareness and wish that we were trained together, but that's not the case right now. And that may be the case in the future. I may join you in ultra running eventually. Maybe I'll come back to Ironman. Maybe we come back to Ironman. But it's just, it, to be honest, it really, it was a transition period. It took some time yeah. you know, to, to, when you don't have your partner there. So yeah, I, I, I love the exploration process. I think we have a good, I think that because, only because you and I have done the deep inner work, like we've turned the mirror and looked into it and really got a good look at how we're moving through the world. And we, we that mirror is in front of me all the time. I'm constantly in a state of self-study that our relationship is athlete and coach, husband and wife, business partners. I mean, it's just always been like our jam, but I would say we're way more in flow than we've ever been. Absolutely. Yeah. There's times we don't even have to talk. We just know. Yeah. We just know what the other one's thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that happens a lot. Okay. We actually play a game like that, too. We do play a game. The like name that. game. <laughs> Can't think of the name. Hold, hold on, it's coming. <laughs> yes. We send each other information <laughs> telepathically. <clears throat> Seriously, we do. Okay. Next question Could you detail what specifically you feed Clark for every meal? So, um, Clark, if you guys don't know Clark, he's our four year old golden retriever and he is plant based. So he's totally vegan. And the reason why he is this way is because he was on normal dog food, you know, dry dog food that we used to feed our other dogs because I didn't even think that they made vegan dog food. And then I realized that they did make vegan dog food. So then I put him on a vegan dry dog food and he was just getting like fat and lethargic and was not thriving and it was bumming me out. He was two years old. So I met with um, my friend Michelle May, who was on the podcast and she um, helped me just come up with really like a basic recipe, figure out how much food he needed and, um, and then we were off and I'm happy to say that he's thriving. He loves his food. And, you know, at the beginning I thought, oh my God, I got to make all his own food. This is going to take so much time, but he really eats what we eat. So just like BJ and I, I don't feed Clark the same thing every day. Like, so to say what he eats for every meal would be an endless list because it varies, really. It varies with every meal. So in the morning, he almost always does have oatmeal in the morning, but what goes on that oatmeal will change. So it will be bananas, sweet potatoes, maybe a little turmeric, cinnamon, some almond butter, um, berries, and we put all that stuff, minus the oatmeal, all that stuff goes in a food processor, so we break it down a little bit. It's a little bit more available for him to absorb it. But basically, it's oatmeal. He gets about a cup and a, to a cup and a half of oatmeal every morning with an additional cup to a cup and a half of like a fruit, vegetable, like compote is what I call it. And I throw spices in there and um, nuts, you know, I'll throw walnuts in there, chia seeds, hemp seeds. It really varies every day. And just like BJ and I, it varies of what we've got in the house. Sometimes it's a half of an avocado on there. And then for dinner time, I do keep a bag of V-Dog, which is a vegan dry dog food. And truth be told, he gets that more often than he doesn't. So at night, he'll get a cup of that. And then on top of that is dinner is like veggie. It's like veggie, veggie, veggie. So peas, broccoli, spinach, Brussels sprouts, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, flax, 
um, seed meal, nutritional yeast, turmeric, little black pepper, all those are, that's kind of his regular rotation of vegetables. And we buy those frozen. Green beans. We buy them mostly frozen, mostly from Trader Joe's or Yeah, uh, I think that there's a less expensive way that you could, can do it, but we do it frozen. It's so easy. So it's, you know, dinner time is dry dog food with a ton of veggies, but to give you the amount, he gets about six cups of food a day, three cups in the morning and about three cups at night. And so if you have like more specific questions on that, let me know. But really there's not much that we eat that he doesn't. Think about a plant-based diet, a whole foods plant-based diet. I mean, anything goes. And he loves everything. Cucumbers, celery. Kale stalks. Kale stalks. Like he eats everything and anything. This dog is super food motivated and he loves, like spinach. He'll eat a leaf of spinach. He'll eat um, red leaf lettuce, green leaf lettuce. I think bananas are his favorite though because you literally just peeled the banana and he came running yeah. into the kitchen. He <laughs> hears the noise. He just loves bananas. Yeah, so he gets fruits, vegetables. He gets everything that we get essentially on a plant-based diet. And, you know, last time he looks great. His coat is great. His weight is great. Last time I took him to the vet, the vet was um, a little appalled at her own diet after hearing about what Clark eats. And so it seems like his team is on board and he's on board. So we continue to monitor his health to make sure that he continues to thrive. And that's the most important thing. Okay. And then the last question is from Sarah. And Sarah is in your, comes to your yoga class. So BJ and Sarah were having a conversation after class today, so we paraphrased her question a bit. But when I come to yoga, everything is calm and peaceful. I want to take that same feeling to the other events and experiences in my life. For instance, school, relationships, family, work. How can I do that? Yeah, in, this, in the essence of this question, it's the calm, the, the presence, the, the focus in our yoga classes of the breath. You know, we teach yoga here uh, in Carlsbad and in Oceanside, and, and we, we follow the Live, Love, Teach uh, yoga teacher training focus, which is on the breath, like bringing the bre- awareness to the breath first, the pose second. And when you do that, what we're finding, or what I find in a lot of my classes, are these people come up to me afterwards and, and they, they feel like they're in the moment. They're in every moment and they, they they remember more moments basically in a yoga class the breath grounds them into where they are feeling everything noticing that they have thoughts but not indulging in the thoughts and so in this experience that sarah has it's her time the 60 minutes the 60 minute class is her time to get away from the to-do list the having to study for tests having to you know, go to a family outing, whatever it is, the pressure to have to do something. And when you get to this yoga class in this, on your tiny little rectangle mat, everything is okay. Everything becomes fine. But that's 60 minutes, that's one hour out of a 24 hour day. So how can you take that, that feeling and apply it to the experiences that you have when you leave that door? You roll up your mat, you leave the door, whoa stuff comes flooding in. You check your email, you check social media, you hop in your car, you're stuck in traffic, somebody cuts you off, you get home, you've got a whole to-do list to get done, you're fatigued when you go to bed, you're, you check social media, you get wrapped up in that, and now what? Now You've lost everything that you've experienced in that yoga class. So bringing, bringing your mind And this is the how, right? We talk about this a lot, the how. How can you bring the calm that you feel when you're on the mat in one of our yoga classes, how can you bring that calm out into the world, into the real life interactions with other people? How can you do that? And the how, we were talking about this actually on our run, the how is coming to presence, coming back to presence. And how do you come back to the present moment? your breath. So if you can come back to your breath and be relentless in coming back, because there's it's, the tenacity and the will and the drive, <clears throat> the willingness to pause, notice that 
you're indulging in this thought, reel things back a little bit and come back to, all you have to do is take a breath. And that sounds so easy, right? I'm saying it sounds so easy, but it really is, guys. It really is easy. Right now, just literally whatever you're doing listening to this podcast, take a breath in and then feel the breath go out. That will interrupt any pattern. That's present. It doesn't mean that like the intensity of a moment, you like you're like all of a sudden that's going to be erased, but it's going to create space between where your awareness is and what it is that you're feeling. And so it's no different than like what I was feeling in meditation yesterday at the gardens. Like I was feeling this like really strong impulses and very uncomfortable, almost like a panic. And I know it was just a layer that was moving through, through me and I needed to sit with it and let it be there. And so I was just breath, 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 like just give me the breath and I'll breathe it. Just give me the breath and I'll breathe it because I knew it was going to pass. So it doesn't mean that, you know, it's going to interrupt the cycle. It's going to break the cycle of the indulgence of the thoughts that are attaching to the sensation of the experience that you're having that is not helpful. It's going to break that immediately. And so you still might be feeling like crap or feeling stressed, but by keeping your awareness on your breath, you're no longer feeding that cycle. And it's a re- it's relentless. Yeah, yeah, so this isn't the magic pill. This isn't like take a breath and now your whole and then it's all world good. is great. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's, it's continually showing up and getting into that space so that you can see these thoughts. Once you begin to notice the thoughts, once you begin to see what's happening upstairs, all this... Like really looking, it's like looking in that mirror, you know, yeah. really seeing the thoughts that you're indulging and the beliefs, right? So... No, go ahead and finish what you're saying. That's when you can begin to get in the space and change them. Yes. So if you see the thought of being angry, when you see a post from somebody who posts whatever, a quote, maybe quotes are upset you when they post it, and you feel that rise up in you and you want to respond, that's when you get in the space and notice that you have a choice. You can... You can... Uh, indulge in the in the response, which is probably your default, which is to get, you know, angry or begin to type and you want to post something or you get into that space and understand that let's just take it at, at its face value. It's just the post. Somebody posts something. They weren't deliberately attacking you with this quote post, basically what they, basically what they did is they had a, 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 a feeling to post something and they did. And what you did is now you're interpreting that message coming through as something that angers you. So it's your relationship to whatever is happening. So when you can get in that space and understand that, that it's not them, it's you. It's actually you and your relationship to it. When you get in that space, you can begin to not indulge in it and understand that you have a choice. Maybe this time I'm not going to indulge in it. And I'm going to think, what is it about that that gets me upset? Like, what is it that that raises the fire inside of me? Yeah. And that's like, that's self-study. So, you know, that rectangle that they sell you and they tell you it's a yoga mat, it's actually a laboratory. And you get on that laboratory and you do all these different shape, make all these different shapes with your body. And if you're in BJ's class, you know, you're breathing a lot or you're in my class, you're breathing a lot and you're being reminded constantly, almost relentlessly to pay attention to the breath. And we're calling the breath. We're telling you when to inhale. We're telling you when to exhale that, um, you, your awareness is so, um, merged in with the breath that the awareness is not on the thoughts anymore or the impulses. And it doesn't mean that those things are going to go away, but you just kind of take this back seat where you can now see them. And then you get to see the impulses of the mind and the tendencies of the mind, right? And if you can see them, then you, you know that they are not who you are because if they were who you are, you wouldn't be able to see them but you can see those thoughts. So they're not you. And so 
you know, the first step to freedom is realizing that, not even realizing, just reminding yourself, because eventually you will realize this, that the mind is not who you are. You're not the mind, you're not the thoughts, you're not the body. That laboratory could be your seat in the classroom. That laboratory can be the driver's seat when you're driving. That laboratory can be your computer as you're looking at Facebook and you're just noticing what arises in you because of what you're seeing. So just like yoga, so we think that yoga, like a yoga class makes us feel calm, but it doesn't. The yoga class is not creating calm. The calm is actually your most natural state is calmness. That's the unshakability. That's the undisturbed. That's the big capital S self is calm. So the yoga class is just bringing out what's already within you. Another example is like when everybody loves to see the sun, sunrise or the sunset. And we love that. It's like, it's this awe moment of like, whew. And it's beautiful and it makes you feel good. And if you're sad, like it just comforts you. And if you're stressed, it calms you. But the calm and the good feeling that comes from that is not created by that. It's simply the catalyst to show you what's already within you. Because there's no possible way to look at something or someone and feel something about that and not have that feeling be inside of you. You there's no way, no way for you to feel something about somebody else or some experience in your life that, you know, school is stressful or whatever. There's no way for you to be able to feel that unless that was already within you. So if you're looking at, you know, relationships, family, obligations, things like that, I would just look at you these belief systems. So you've got a belief system that's really helpful. You have a belief system that yoga makes you feel calm and peaceful. And so it's just a belief system because you are calm and peaceful. That's your essence. But it's easy to say, it's easy to have belief systems that say that school is stressful, work is stressful. It works the same way. Family obligation. And those are just belief systems. So I would look at those and why couldn't you change that belief system to say family family outings make me feel peaceful and calm and just have fun with it and just see. Because now you're telling yourself a new story. So you're interrupting the cycle. So that, that's something to play with. Um, and also that school, relationships, family. Family is amazing at showing you what's inside of you. So, you know, notice what comes up. What are these sensations that are coming up? It's no different than being in BJ's class and holding warrior two and having sensation in your arm. That pose is creating intensity in your life. That family is creating intensity. And then you have a response to that intensity. So the response is what you really want to look at. And that's when you want to interrupt it, interrupt the indulgence I should say, with the breath. Yeah, notice the thoughts. Notice that you have a choice. You can indulge or not indulge. Right. Right, you have a choice. And we say that in our yoga classes a lot, at least I do, that they have a choice. There's plenty of opportunities throughout class where you have a choice. You have a choice to, you know, take warrior two with your palms down or you can take them with your palms up. And you have a choice to drop your arms if you choose. So it's it, the yoga class is the laboratory is a is the maybe the building <laughs> that houses the mm-hmm. laboratory where you have the opportunity to work on these things so mm-hmm. when you call out the breath when you call out the the instruction to just notice what's coming up close your eyes and focus these are the things that you can use when you interact with your family or your partner how long has sarah been coming to your class she's been coming a couple months couple months now. So my experience, Sarah, is that, um, you're going to, these things are going to continue to transcend, um, the mat and they're going to continue to become a part of your life. Like this specific practice that you're doing with BJ is from my experience, the practice that changed my life because I was going and, you know, really doing that self-study within the class, but then taking it off the mat. So the same, listen to the words that BJ's using in class and like the things that resonate, um, 
take those with you and let them marinate. The things that don't resonate, just leave them for now. Just leave them for now. But take the things that really hit you and take those into your life. And maybe you write them down after class. Maybe you make a note on your phone about them. You can record the class too. But well, yeah, you can record. That's an awesome thing to do. Like you could bring your phone in and just hit the voice memos and record the class. I let people do that too. I could care less. But like, I can't guarantee that I'll say the same things or because I don't have a script. You don't right. have a script. These are things that just come from presence. But the more that you practice it, the more that it becomes your practice for the way that you live. You know, yoga will the the real effects of yoga the real benefits of yoga happen on the cellular level when belief systems start to change behavior patterns start to change um the thoughts that we indulge start to change the pace at which we move through the world starts to change these are all cellular changes where you know, yoga does become a way of life. Yoga is not just a 60 minute class. It is a lifestyle. So stay with it. Keep picking BJ's brain and, um, and then just watch because it's, there's no way this is not going to infiltrate your life unless you really shut it off when you leave that mat. But it would, it's going to take effort. I think, um, the more and more that you come. Awesome. I think that's it boss. Yeah. I think we've, we've covered everything. All the questions from couple weeks ago and yeah. this week. So we record these every month. So please hit us up on all social platforms or just email us. Let us know if you have questions. Yeah, we're going to wrap it up. Oh, and I opened my own Instagram account today. So watch out. Yeah, IG. watch out. See, uh, see if I get in trouble on Instagram, but uh, no supervision. Now I'm just going to be uh, detailing my training and dropping the wisdom bombs as they move through me. These are not words that, you know, I pre-write and, and read about. This stuff just moves through me and I just wanted a, another platform to share it. So my handle is Jess Gumkowski on Instagram. So uh, give me a follow and um, yeah, see if you like what you, what you see. Love it. All right, you guys, we'll be back next week with uh, another amazing interview. Um, I can't wait to, to launch it, but hope you guys enjoyed the show. Let us know if you have any questions. And um, until then, you guys, whatever it is, whatever it is that keeps showing up in your life, right? Like look at those patterns. Look at the things that keep repeating in your life. These are the things that you came here to get to the other side of. And it all starts with just deepening your awareness to that present moment. So take a breath.